Good evening, I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to this special election edition of This Week in Northern California. Joining me tonight are Carla Marinucci, San Francisco Chronicle senior political writer, Richard Gonzalez, reporter with National Public Radio, and Jerry Roberts, Cal Buzz editor. And joining us from Sacramento, Dan Walters, Sacramento Bureau columnist. Jerry, there are two major issues that are game changers in this election. One, of course, is redistricting, and the other one is this top two system for choosing a winner. Explain the, the last one, because it seems to be the most confusing. Well, Belva, as you know, uh, historically, uh, the primaries in, in California and, and elsewhere have really been a very decisive vote uh, because we had a gerrymandered state, because the districts were either overwhelmingly Republican or overwhelmingly Democrat as a general rule. Now the parties get thrown out the window in the, in the primary, so whoever finishes first and second, regardless of what primary they are, will go on to the November election. The idea, of course, was to try to get more moderate voters, uh, moderate representatives up in Sacramento and in, and in Washington. And it's really the first test for it, and, and it's kind of an interesting experiment in political reform and one that the voters uh, approved overwhelmingly two years ago. So mm -hmm. that's the first test. Yeah. I mean, this is a system unlike any in any other state, um, Jerry. I mean, I, the, the question is, are the incumbents really going to sweat this one out? Is there a reason? Is, it, is this going to change the game for any of them here in California? I think in terms of the top two primary, it's going to be kind of incremental at this point. I don't see major change. But I think in terms of the redistricting, the other measure that, that you mentioned, Belva, it's going to be really big. Uh, as everybody knows, it was an independent commission that did the uh, redrew the li lines this time rather than having it done uh, in Sacramento, people drawing their own lines. And there's some big changes. One, there's a lot more competitive races. There's about 30 uh, in, a, in a state where one uh, House seat overturned in, within 10 years, so that's going to be a change. Second is a lot of incumbents landed in the same district, about 75 districts where that's the case. And third, partisanship. I think the Democrats are in to make some big gains. Republicans keep uh, dropping in their registration, and, and uh, so it's going to be a, an interesting thing well, to let's, watch. Well, let's bring Dan Walters in. He's up there in Sacramento. We've been watching all of this for decades. <laughs> Don't remind me, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> I was century. Oh. Since Jerry well, Brown I've been was a, watching him with you, okay? Yeah, since Jerry Brown was a young man, let's put it that way. Yes. <laughs> with hair. Yeah. With hair, right. So, so do you take this as serious as we're sounding here? Uh, I think that that's uh, about right. There's, there's probably going to be some Democratic gains in the uh, both the state Senate uh, and maybe enough to get two-thirds vote, probably enough to get a two-thirds vote in the state Senate, and probably mm -hmm. maybe three, four, five seats in the congressional delegation. But I think uh, Nancy Pelosi probably overstates the case to say that California is going to somehow put the Democrats back in control of the House because you, they're going to suffer some losses in other states, states that have gained population and gained seats, Republican fast-growing states in the South and the Southwest. And so uh, I don't know of anybody who really thinks that Democrats have much of a chance of actually retaking control of the House. The real question is, are they going to lose control of the Senate at mm -hmm. the same there this year? But I, but I tell you, Belle, I mean, I think this makes for some interesting races in California, particularly when you're talking about Democrats versus Democrats in some of these districts. I mean, let's take Lynn Woolsey's district on the coast, where you've got t 12 people vying for this uh, seat eight Democrats, and, and they're all trying to out-liberal each other. <laughs> this is a district where, you know, 62% of the voters are, are Democratic. Most of them love legal legalized or medicinal marijuana. I mean, it, it, this has been a, a fascinating race for so many reasons. That, that's an example, I think, of how well, the top two primaries is working. This I'm going to get you into this conversation. Well, I want to ask Dan a question. Dan, this is Richard Gonzalez. You just mentioned that uh, the Democrats have a chance of getting a two-thirds majority in the Senate. What would that mean for future budget battles? Well, it may mean a lot or not. If they get two-thirds vote, all it really means is they could pass tax bills uh, without the Republican votes. But you would still have the problem of the assembly where there's really no chance for the Democrats to get two-thirds in the assembly this year or probably any other year in this decade. So it may not change anything. It may give them some psychological edge, but it may not actually change the, the pragmatics of the thing. And speaking of the top two, how can we forget Berman Sherman? I mean, the race of the century, millions of dollars are being spent in Southern California between two veteran Democratic congressmen, Brad Sherman and Howard Berman, the shootout of the century. I mean, it's incredible. Two Jewish liberal Democrats 
fighting over who's more uh, faithful to Israel and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 a, it. That's the one of the, That's the one really to watch. I, yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you, Dan. And I think he, in the East Bay, we've got another sort of Democrat versus Democrat uh, issue going on with Pete Stark, the dean of the California delegation, 20-term congressman, 80 years old. In normal times, does he know he's the dean? That's <laughs> the question. <laughs> in normal times, he wouldn't have to sweat this at all. And under the top two primary in his district. District, high, very democratic district. He has to worry about now a 31-year-old challenger, Eric Swalwell, a, a deputy a, a Alameda County a district attorney, who has really been taking it to him. We're going to see what happens when he comes out of the primary. Will those be the top two that go on to November? And then, I mean, another really interesting thing to watch in terms of the top two is that Abel Maldonado, the former state senator from Santa Maria and down south, and, and one-time lieutenant governor, was the person who got this top, top two. Uh, uh, system put in place by uh, trading his vote for a budget a few years ago. He's now in a race for Congress uh, against uh, an incumbent, uh, Lois Capps, Democrat Lois Capps. But he's got a Tea Party guy who's going after him and, and has a, a possibility of finishing second. So Abel could f uh, end up finishing out of the money even though he created this whole Which thing. Which brings up an issue, I think, Richard, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this. I mean, the Republican Party in California did not endorse Abel Maldonado, probably the most well known Latino, I mean, a, a statewide. A, former lieutenant governor here, what does it say about the future of the Republican Party with Latino voters? It makes you wonder what are they thinking. The Republican Party right now seems to be hamstrung. They can't get over this issue, which is they've got to find a way to, to connect with the Latino voters, but they simply cannot find it within themselves to take even the first step to do that. You remember uh, several years ago, uh, Ruben Perales uh, ran for a uh, statewide um, uh, a post. Couldn't raise any money, even though the Republicans, Stu Spencer was saying, the uh, Re Republican strategist, Stu Spencer says, we got to get behind Ruben Perales. It's the future of our, of our party. And he, nothing happened. He ne and so. No, I, and that, I mean, that's a good example of how the Republican Party is putting ideological uh, purity in California above almost anything else. Um, and, you know, they're even bringing out the big guns. Grover Norquist, the great anti tax uh, pledge person, uh, put a blistering a piece up on Flash Report, a conservative website here, attacking Maldonado and saying no good Republican should vote for him. Can I say one, one more thing about the top two? It's creating some strange politics trying to get into that top two. Who would have ever thought that Howard Berman would be sending mail to Republicans <laughs> asking them to vote for him? <laughs> Howard right, Berman, yeah. the great Satan to Republicans, is asking for Republican votes. And of course, the great irony there is that it was uh, Berman and his brother, Michael Berman, who uh, engineered most of the gerrymanders yes, for the last 25 years, yeah. and now Howard's the guy who really finds yeah, talking, it's all in the talking spot. Talking to Willie Brown today on this top two, he said the only, oh, the only ones who win in this one are the political consultants because even if you get 51 percent in the primary you still have to go on to the general election this is a, the system unlike any other state uh, so the consultants win all the way to november that's exactly how they design they, they, they always win they always win well, they always win well, ross always wins <laughs> we've been talking about the republican party here you, you know them intimately would you say that they're blowing it again that's so what richard was uh, was alluding to. I mean, have they put? Do they have a game plan that will bring in Latino voters that would could booster their number numbers in the uh, in the Congress here? If you're asking me, no, they I'm don't. Asking you. They <laughs> talk about it a lot, but they, they actually haven't done it. No, I, I think the Republicans have. Uh, part of it is changing the demographics of California, certainly, but part of it is certainly that the party has shot itself in the foot uh, over and over and over again. You know, it's hard to believe, but. Up until the middle 90s, this was, in many respects, a Republican state exactly. at the presidential level, and and the Republicans won eight of the top top ticket elections in the 1980s. It's an amazing to see that kind of a decline. Well, that's right. When when Bill Clinton won the state in 1992 for president, that was the first time a Democrat had won since 1964. Lyndon Johnson's. Uh, a landslide, and it all began, to, as you know, Richard, go, go south for them uh, in 1994 with Proposition 187, which which Pete Wilson endorsed. And you know, the Mitt Romney and the Republicans, they say, well, Latino voters are not one issue voters; they don't really care that much about immigration, and and that that's right. But isn't it the fact that that's a threshold issue, and they really can't get beyond that as long as they're using the rhetoric that they are? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Latino voters are just like 
every other California voter. Jobs in the economy, good schools for, for, for the kids, safe streets. But there, you'd be hard pressed to find any Latino voter who either doesn't have a, a, a close relative who is an immigrant or mom and dad or their grandparents were immigrants. So the immigration issue is still close to the heart and the home, even if it isn't a real salient issue on a day-to-day -day level. Which is why the presidential race, although there's no drama there, does sort of rip, have a ripple effect. When you're talking about the DREAM Act, when yeah. you're talking about uh, one of Mitt Romney's co-chairs being Pete Wilson in California, the former governor, uh, does that not resonate with, <laughs> with Latino voters still to but this day? Yeah, but there's another thing. You have to kind of wonder also, you, you remember George Bush got 44% of the Latino vote right. when he ran for president. And you kind of wonder, the, the big crackdown, I mean, much worse crackdown than we saw in any of the previous administration on, on illegal immigration by the Obama administration, does that backfire in some way down the way? Down it's the an interesting point, Dan, because George Bush had a rhetoric, had an understanding of Latino voters, uh, and, and had a, a, a very sort of welcoming a view and welcoming message to them about hope and coming to this country. And you're not hearing that. You're absolutely right. There is a difference between Bush and, and Romney and Bush and Obama. Well, he also had a policy. I mean, there, he, he was for comprehensive immigration reform, which includes a pathway to citizenship. And nobody for wants folks to talk that about here. that these days. And he had a sister in law who's Latina. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I don't think you can just say, oh, I want to, you know, crack down on the border. I want to crack down on the border. At some point, you have to address the, the citizenship well, every, issue. Every election cycle, we look for the group that could be the swing, the little small percentage that's going to make a difference in the big election. And so we know that the Latinos have the numbers now.